Thank you for joining today's Partner Talks, where we'll be discussing the Global Supply Chain Stability Index and the results from Q4 2022. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Douglas Kent, the Executive Vice President of Corporate and Strategic Alliances at ASCM, and Jim Lee, the Managing Director of Supply Chain Advisory at KPMG. Without any further ado, I'll give Douglas Kent the opportunity to give a little bit more background about ASCM as an organization. Great. Thank you, Blake, and, and welcome, everybody. So as Blake mentioned, Douglas Kent is Vice President for Corporate and Strategic Alliances here at ASCM. Uh, really pleased to be joined by Jim Lee today. Um, we've been working very hard on this Supply Chain Stability Index. Uh, before I hand it over to Jim for an introduction, maybe just a little bit about ASCM. As most of you probably already know, ASCM is the largest uh, supply chain association in the world, been uh, operating since 1957. We certified over 100,000 professionals. We're headquartered out of Chicago, USA, uh, and we have over 100 training partners around the globe. So welcome from my side. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Lee. I am part of our, as you can see on the slide here, uh, our supply chain strategy and analytics practice at KPMG. I lead all things supply chain AI for our clients and for our firm. Um, most of my time is spent advising clients in the consumer and retail uh, goods uh, industry, but uh, certainly I've done my share of work in industrial and tech sectors and other industries as well. Uh, likewise, uh, Douglas, I'm happy to be here with uh, our ASCM partners and friends, I should say. Uh, Apex and SCORE, the SCORE model in particular, has played a, a critical role in my early days as a supply chain consulting professional. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Douglas, for having me. Great. Thank you, Jim. And we're not going to talk about how many days we've been in the business while we're together today. So. Um, so let's just go back to kind of where this this kind of all started, um, because we have this unique situation, Jim, where there's a lot of macro factors which are happening simultaneously and, and really is is driving a critical amount of stress into the supply chain, making supply chains more fragile. Certainly, you know, the, the, the terminology we hear at the C-suite now is all about supply chain resiliency and how do we build more strategic and operational resiliency in light of whatever that new normal might be. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and these macro factors, of course, include things like what's happening relative to inflation and recession, includes the very critical global workforce shortage that we have. Um, and most importantly is, is we're in an unprecedented situation with the demand and the supply shocks that have been hitting um, the system. So even though these are all interesting macro factor topics, we're gonna, focus today, particularly around the ongoing supply chain disruption, which is really the reason why KPMG uh, ideated around the supply chain stability index because of the, the understanding which is necessary for the C-suite and other supply chain leaders to understand what is actually happening, what are the driving variables that are causing instability, and what could or should we be doing about that. So if we go to the next slide, Blake. Uh, is really that was the launch of, of the, the study really around our ASCM Connect conference in September of this year. Um, and we released the very first um, part of that study at that time. Um, Jim, maybe in the next slide, you could talk a little bit about um, how the index was developed and a little bit about um, you know, the factors, the, the, the breadth of the different disruptive factors that have to be considered as we took all of these years worth of data and forced it into some machine learning to give us the index output. Yeah, of course, um, certainly. So um, Douglas, I don't know if you recall or not, but uh, you know, you invite ASCM invited us to a workshop uh, with ASCM and a number of its members. I can't remember some at some point last year, maybe it was the middle of last year. And that's where we actually talked about this stability index for the first time after we worked together on, on building this out. Um, and I kicked off that session with some remarks made by um, Alan Jobe, who's the CEO of Unilever, one of the largest CPG companies in the world. Um, he made these remarks at the uh, Consumer Goods Forum in early earlier that year in 2022. He said that 
crisis is going to carry on being our, our norm for quite some time, uh, meaning that companies should get used to the idea of crisis being more or less the new normal, to your point, the new norm. And here we are, it's a year <laughs> since I said that, or since I, or we had that session and we talked about that. Another year has gone by and that statement could not be any more true, right? We are still in this volatile environment. Um, market volatility is, is certainly the new norm, right? It's had a substantial impact on nearly every part of the supply chain. There's no hiding from it. Um, and it's really this volatility that you see on the slide here where we talk about all these events occurring, not just sequentially, but simultaneously, the confluence of these different types of events. Um, and it's just been nonstop and it continues to be so. Um, so that volatility is driving the supply chain variability, right? Which is really the, you know, the reason why we, we joined forces with ASCM to, to really convey our viewpoint and perspective in a way to quantify this instability, or we should call it stability of supply chains. Um, and that's really, you know, where this came from, right? We wanted to, we all know about supply disruptions. We all are aware of the freight costs. Um, we're, we're aware about the labor shortages, but, you know, and we, and we read the news and we see the ups and downs, but can we put a number to that? Can we quantify that? Can we see any patterns over time? Um, no one can predict the future, but to get a better view and better quantifiable understanding of this volatility and what it's doing to supply chain organizations, um, we felt that would be a tremendous help, right? And to, to be that voice uh, for the marketplace. Um, and so that's really, you know, what drove the, the stability index and, and brought it to fruition. Yeah, and I think that genesis, what we all intuitively, just as you, as, as you well quoted, um, we always had the sentiment that there was going to be no return back to whatever norm was. Uh, but to be able to actually quantify that, I think that's that's critically important for us. And 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 also just to reemphasize just the breadth of the different activities. When it seems always that when one thing becomes better, we see now, for example, uh, sea freight capacity and costs are going down. Not not back to a norm, but they're certainly down from their height, you know, where there was a 10x increase in a matter of 12 to 16 months, where we went from $1,800 for a container shipment from Asia to the port of LA, uh, and that went up to a height of 18,000. In fact, we saw industries that were retailers in particular, uh, they were not, not just looking for, <laughs> they were not just looking for containers, they were actually renting entire vessels, right? <laughs> Right. Um, so as soon as one thing gets better, Jim, right, then something else goes awry. Now we have all this geopolitical instability relative to the Ukraine war, as emphasized here. So it isn't just, you know, we were, I think, initially focused very much on, you know, what the pandemic influence mm -hmm. to instability was. And I think we're, we're, we're much further beyond that. So let's talk a little bit about that, Blake, on the next slide. Um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, what what variables are in there, but you know, how, how did the index come about in terms of um, actually bringing that set of variables down to a quantified number that we see here? And then we can talk a little bit about the trajectory. That's right. So um, not to bore the audience to death uh, with a dissertation uh, around data science, but that is really the fundamental foundation of this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we, we, this is backed by uh, quite a number of supply chain data points, uh, really KPIs that really measure supply chain performance, right? Uh, as you can see there, um, 14 years of that data, right? Uh, 27 different variables and KPIs, classic ones, right? All, all revolving around service level, you know, OTIF, inventory levels and shortages and excess, um, different types of costs. Um, and of course, labor, right? So it is definitely a, an, an amalgam uh, of data uh, that really, you know, what we were aiming for was a broad holistic view of supply chain performance, but not just performance, but the variation, right? Because it's all about supply chain variability driven by all of these events that you've seen, that you see over time, right? It's a bit sporadic in, you know, a couple of decades back, but uh, as, as we all know, uh, when we hit that, uh, that point in 2020, it's just quite a number of events that have, has occurred. And, and as Douglas mentioned, it's been nonstop. Um, and so, so that's really, you know, the, the data foundation. And based on that data, 
Um, we certainly, you know, our data science teams and uh, the SMEs, including Douglas and others at ASCM, you know, put our heads together and we really uh, wanted to figure out a way to uh, bring this data to life. And uh, the best way we thought we could do that was through uh, machine learning algorithms. So we used um, a number of different algorithms, the predominant one being a factor-based analysis for you data scientists out there, it's very similar uh, to the PCA type of algorithm. But basically, we use this algorithm to make sense of the data and help us build this index, right? There's no, there's no single number or KPI to measure stability, right? That doesn't exist, right? That's not observable. Um, and so we needed to use machine learning to come up with this uh, index based on that data and that algorithm, right? And so, so what we have here is you know, and I'll quote uh, one of our data scientists, Zach Rhodes. This is this is like a barometer, right? It's a measure of temperature uh, of the stability of a supply chain, right? How how well it can, you know, what it's facing in terms of supply chain variability across the board. Um, and as you can see, uh, over the past couple of decades, it's been relatively in the same range, right? A little bit of up and down. Uh, but then, as I mentioned, once once you hit 2020, which will called the new norm, um, it's you just see that massive increase, right? Um, and yes, it's been, uh, you know, tra trajectory has been, uh, you know, going downwards over the past year or so, um, but that's still, you know, it's still way up there, right? There's still a massive gap and 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 um, and changes that are still taking place. So we are certainly still in this new norm of volatility uh, and uh, we are not out of uh, the neck of the woods yet. Yeah, in fact, we can just see it. You can just see that little slight uptick, right? Uh, as we as we take a look at the the first month of, of 2023, and I think you said it very well, um, Jim. You know, as, as as we had our geek out, geek out moments on what variables could be used and what does that mean, and how do how do you actually come up with something that's quantifiable? If, if you do just simplify the message here, it's simply correct me if I'm wrong, is to say we're twice as fragile as we were in whatever we called the situation of the norm, which would be to the left. And we see a lot more stability in those years, particularly from 2018 to 2020. We see, you know, as you said, relatively stable, a little bit ups and downs. There were some events, particularly some geo events that happened that caused some of the instability there. We can see uh, some trade wars with China, so some geopolitical events driving some of that instability in the early uh, years of that norm period. Uh, but then you see that trajectory clearly going up and towards the right with a multitude of different events of all different types. The cybersecurity related events, of course, the pandemic with the first Omicron, uh, or Omicron uh, variant as well. We had the, the, great, the boat that got stuck in the Suez Canal. Then we started the Russia, you, you, not we started, but the Russia-Ukraine war started. Um, et cetera, more geopolitical events. Um, and, you know, it'd be interesting with the, with the um, zero COVID now blocks in, in, in China and that being a little bit more open, what will happen with that? We was, it was a big scare factor post uh, Chinese New Year. So it didn't seem to have played out as bad as it could have. That's, a, that's good news. Uh, but we're still sitting, right? Twice as, so twice as unstable, twice as fragile as we were before whatever the new norm is. So let's talk about some of the, uh, I think, really enlightening learnings that, that came from this. And this, this first one, Jim, I got to say, I wouldn't have predicted this. Thank God for machine learning, right? Thank God for the ability to use a brain smarter than mine, because we wouldn't have expected that freight and labor compared to capacity and supply, we wouldn't have expected that it would have been such a high contributor, right? This is now up 70%. If we take the two categories of freight and labor in terms of their contribution to the stability index variation, I wouldn't have expected that. What yeah, also no, becomes no. interesting, I think, and love your, your view on this as well, is when we think about traditional ways in which we try to manage variable demand and supply, it's through a traditional sales and operations planning process, right? We're taking a look at, you know, how do we get the demand accuracy more correct? How do we identify potential constraints with regards to material availability and manufacturing capacities in particular? But we're not talking about things that affect fulfillment. We're not talking about 
you know, the availability of the workforce at a warehouse or a truck driver or a port operator or a custom clearance person. We didn't have that conversation. We treated, uh, you know, job availability. We treated, um, in essence, logistics at, at large as infinite capacities. And of course, that clearly didn't prove itself out. So maybe just talk a little bit more. I, I, I know we had the conversation. I was certainly surprised by this. It's, it also drives, I think, a, a need for different behaviors relative to supply chain planning. But I'd love your view um, on the freight and labor contribution here. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And yeah, I, I remember that aha moment when we saw, saw this. And we, and we still, it's an aha moment as we see, you know, it, it change and fluctuate. Um, yeah, freight and labor. You know, freight, I think, is been widely publicized. Uh, and again, we're not out of the neck of the woods yet on that either. I know freight has com come down, as you mentioned, on ocean freight. Um, domestic freight as well is, is, is getting better, but we're still not out. There's, you know, there's negotiated long-term contracts. A lot of folks are stuck with certain rates out there. So yep. there's still a lot of challenge there. Um, but, uh, but the labor piece, wow. You know, that's, you know, it's, labor is one of those things, just like freight, uh, it's not something, it's not a new challenge, as you said, you know, especially in, in, when it comes to supply chain execution, which we'll call warehouse transportation and even manufacturing. Um, it's always been a problem, attrition and turnover. Um, it's just over these three years, we've hit, it's just become unbearable, right? It's just been su super exacerbated. Um, and so that is, that is something that we're, I think, is not just based on what we see in the stability index, but in my conversations with clients, it's probably the top, one of the top three topics every single time. It is, it is at the top of that list, all things labor in terms of labor shortages, layoffs, hiring and retention, up, going down, it doesn't matter. It's, it's I think what you're insinuating is it's not just about the increases and decreases, it's that fluctuation and how quickly and how massive that becomes in a short period of time. Um, so we have, you know, at KPMG, we, we have our chief economist, Diane Swank, and she, you know, she's certainly had her perspective on this. And I agree with her completely that labor demand is cooling, but not enough to meet a, what we'll call a structural shortage of labor, structural meaning abnormally long periods of unemployment driven by massive shifts in economy or technology and workforce skill sets. So if we think about December uh, of 2022, the ratio of job openings to job seekers uh, was 1.9. That's two job opportunities for every job seeker. So the Federal Reserve, their strategy has been to obviously uh, to, to really temper this inflation. It has been to increase rates. And they want to see the ratio closer to 1.0, right? One job for one seeker. Um, because if that labor gap in supply chain and you know, across all other industries, if it's not closed, we could see another surge in hiring and wages, which can ultimately exacerbate the labor shortage problem that we're already in and potentially drive even more inflation, right? Supply chain is smack dab in the middle of that, as you know, to your point, Douglas, about warehousing and transportation. Uh, based on the stability index data, warehousing and transportation job opening rates, they, they've peaked at about three to 5% in that range for the past two decades. But over the last three years, it's gone to 8.3%. That's massive, more than double, right? Um, simultaneously on the unemployment side, those rates have always been kind of low and it's, you know, the lowest it's been recently, it's been 3.6. So job openings up, unemployment really far down, it's just a massive gap. And, and we've seen some uptick, right? And some resolution to that a bit, uh, as you mentioned, but that's still a massive labor gap to close. And so we have, it's something that we're, we're going to have to deal with, supply chains are gonna to have to deal with for quite some time. Yeah, and it's been, I mean, to pull on a couple of those key points, Jim. So one of the things of course, is how attractive are we making supply chain as a profession? And are we educating the entry level worker? So certainly as an association, this is something we've been desperately focused on, not only credentialing the supply chain professional, but also providing and creating education, training, certificate programs, et cetera, for those who are entering the profession, making it more attractive. I think as a, as a profession, we've done a terrible job <laughs> making, sharing really the sexy nature of what it is that we do. I mean, you know, look at the analytics skills, the, the digital training on order entry and 
how, how things work in, in, inside of a warehouse. I mean, these, these are critical skills and competencies that I think are maybe one of the best untold stories, right? It, it really is something when you enter into it, it's not just a job. It really is an entry into a profession. So we as an association have been super focused on that. Um, the other point I want to just emphasize that you that you rightly made is, you know, obviously filling this gap is no easy thing. But even as we see, for example, pricing of, as we mentioned before, and it's true on multimodal pricing, but certainly ocean freight pricing coming down, et cetera, we're not seeing the PPI index coming down, right? We're not seeing that happen. So we're having to attract in labor. We have to pay more, right, to the point where goods haven't yet become cheaper, right? And this is this is where I think when you take the macro factor into play, you say, wow, normally when you see the total cost of goods going down, because for example, the cost of freight goes down, we would hope to see that the overall PPI would also start dropping. We haven't seen that yet, right? Um, and I think as, again, as, as you mentioned, as protracted as this continues to be, I think the more we're gonna actually see that situation continue. Um, so yeah, so we, we had that aha moment, but let's then talk of, on the next slide about capacity and, and, and supply from, from that perspective as well. Um, so of course, what we see is that commodity and raw material costs, to my point, are, 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 are still up there, right? So we don't see the cost of goods going down uh, as we might have expected. But let's talk about inventory because everybody likes, everybody's talking about inventory right now. I mean, initially it was, you know, uh, the number one answer to resiliency was, you know, got a bunch, got a hunch by a bunch, right? So uh, we were just buying to try to keep ourselves protected, keep our service levels high to the customer, uh, protect revenue, et cetera, but at a very expensive cost. And now we see inventory kind of, uh, you know, uh, certainly again, going back to retail is perhaps the best example. There is a glut of inventory and people trying to figure out what to do with that store it sell it discounted etc but let's let's talk about inventory and 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 how you see that playing into this whole picture yeah no it's a very good point and inventory like many other dimensions that we've talked about um we've seen it go in both directions depending on the scenario depending on the industry depending on you know the timing um so yeah we've seen it in both extremes shortage or excess and or excess um which really goes back to the point of the stability index it's it, it's not meant to be, you know, some sort of, you know, tool to, to, for, to arm supply chain practitioners to say, hey, this is how I'm going to implement this quick fix. Now, it's, it's really about the long term, you know, uh, view of this, uh, which is really um, the fluctuation, the ongoing ups and downs, right, uh, in terms of stability or we, we can say instability. It's, you know, as, as we, we called out earlier, this index is our way of, of putting the spotlight on variability, be it inventory or labor, whatever it may be, not just on service and, and cost, um, but the fluctuation of all of these dimensions, because um, to build, as you, you know, the, the phrase that you mentioned earlier, Douglas, resilience, to build effective resili resilience um, and or agility, uh, we need to understand where the variability is going, what we're dealing with and where it's heading. Um, and that that's, you know, inventory is a great example of that um, in retail in terms of the glut. Uh, and at one point in time, it was the opposite. Um, so uh, it, it's it's been it's definitely been uh, a, a, um, a ride, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, the ups and downs of inventory levels. I mean, a lot of that is, you know, all these things that you see here are kind of interrelated, right? Um, the raw, you know, what, what's causing a lot of these ups and downs? Raw material costs, right? Commodity prices going up and down, um, uh, uh, supply disruptions and material shortages, right? Um, all of this all kind of in, interlaced as well as even labor, right? All of it kind of com comes back to, um, you know, how they all are, are contributing to that inventory problem. So yeah, you know, in terms of my and the clients that we've worked with uh, over the past year, inventory it certainly has been a predominant issue. Just as of, you know, if not uh, as important as as labor uh, and the many, you know, we have a top ten list of all these different challenges that uh, clients are dealing with. But um, inventory is certainly up there, um, and we're seeing a lot of different tactics being put into play in terms of optimizing that level of inventory. 
Yeah, let's talk about those interrelationships because Jim, that's a, a terrific point because what we do see is, you know, and, and at, at risk of sounding pessimistic about what the future is, let's talk about the optimism, right? So the good thing is that, that it, you know, recognition that there are operating model, supply chain operating model competencies that we perhaps didn't focus enough on. Inventory strategy and policy is a great example. Um, supply chain network design and optimization and that interrelationship to where and how you store inventory. These are, these are now what we're seeing. These are operating model competencies that organizations are now investing in, right? How do I run scenarios against my supply chain network? Do I build out a digital twin, et cetera? So the, the good news is there's recognition of the level of importance and then therefore that competency is being built out in organizations. That also is driving some of the workforce issues because now we're now we're either expanding or bringing in capabilities that maybe previously didn't even exist. So I got to go out and find those skill sets. I, I got to grow my talent to be able to do the things that I want them to do. So just that sort of interrelationship factor um, that's there. And, you know, that's a good point. You know, the inventory optimization tactics that are being put into play, the network optimization, but also, as you mentioned, the skill set, uh, you know, to go back to what we were talking about, what are the tactics, you know, how are how are companies, you know, tackling the labor challenge? That's that's a pretty tough one, right? Um, I'd say, you know, we, we had a recent um, survey, KPMG Global Economic Outlook Survey, and we polled our, you know, these clients, these companies and these executives and 76% of these executives plan to invest in labor saving tech. Tech is a, a, a huge enabler to a number of these challenges, including labor. Um, and they're doing this, especially uh, in, in terms of the workforce to ensure investments have productivity growth to justify yeah. those higher wage gains. It's not by substituting capital for labor, but by using tech, AI, robotics, and automation uh, to bridge those skill gaps and to really uh, look at look at labor and not just this near-term labor shortage problem, but labor in general for the long term. Yeah, I think that's a really and 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 that's a Pandora's box. If we open, like, what do you do with de-skilling in order to apply technology and etc. Um, I think people get scared of that a little bit, um, but really that's it's the answer to make not just a more efficient and productive workforce, but one that's happier with what what is left for them to do, because that's the stuff that really the value add is. Right. Um, so I, I know we're running out of time, but I, I got to hit one more topic with you because it's always one that the media is asking about. So I, I'm going to get Jim's prediction. It's unfair. I'm going to throw one out there on you, Jim. Um, so, you know, all of this instability always brings back up the topic nearshoring reshoring right um and you know when we see whenever we get the fear factor it never seems quite to play out right we don't see the migration of course you know rechanging that network is always something that uh is expensive right to do and and you know it's not something that typically can be considered a, you know, a light decision. There's a lot of CapEx involved in it. There's a lot of vendor supplier disruption involved in it, et cetera. So what do you think about that, Jimmy? What do you think we're gonna see relative to some de-risking activities if we do see ongoing geopolitical events, particularly in, in, in and around Asia? There's been a lot of visibility and chatter about semiconductor epicenter of Taiwan being of, of high risk and high concern, and thus the CHIPS Act, et cetera. But what's your view on the level of reshoring, nearshoring that we might see in the future? Um, I, I, it's, um, it's quite substantial. Uh, I mean, it's the, in one word, it's de-risking. Uh, and we're seeing it now. It's, not, it's, it's This is less of a prediction because um, we're already seeing it now. Uh, with the number of at least my clients uh, uh, that we work with at KPMG um, in terms of uh, suppliers and contract manufacturers and partners uh, basically in those high risk areas. And then looking at, we're working with clients today um, to, to, to set their three to five year strategy on where they should, uh, how they can de-risk their, their supply base um, and contract manufacturing base, their manufacturing base uh, in different countries and different continents. So. It's, you know, and, and what's the, what's the uh, silver bullet? There isn't one. It's, uh, I'd say it's a smorgasbord of different options, right? Looking at different countries, um, you know, uh, insourcing operations, 
um, uh, nearshoring, offshoring, reshoring, you name it. Um, so it's really uh, finding the right mix of that. Uh, the only constant, the only uh, thing that everyone is, uh, you know, uh, is moving towards is uh, is that strategy of de-risk, right? And everyone's kind of taking a different approach, but uh, it is a mixed bag of different tactics. So um, my prediction, uh, you know, uh, is is that that will continue, right? And it'll it'll certainly grow throughout this year, probably into next year. Yeah, and it's not an easy thing. And of course, those choices, as we mentioned, are, are difficult ones. I was in Mexico last week. Um, and when you think about that as a potential manufacturing replacement to previous outsourcing options in, in Asia, for example, uh, for US-based demand in particular, uh, it happens to be the two countries um, that have the highest GDP differential that are bordering countries, right? So as an option and, and with, you know, with road freight, um, you know, being a, a good option to the variability that has been in ocean freight coming from another low cost manufacturing at the center. It certainly um, all indications are that could be a good option again for, for UI space demand. But of course, these are all different kinds of strategies that could be put in place for that de-risking. Um, Jim, I, I got to say, I, we, you and I could talk about this all day long, but unfortunately we can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to take just a few moments to, to, first of all, thank everybody who joined or will watch uh, later. Uh, link in with both Jim and I. Um, definitely love to um, love to get you involved and, and, and continue the conversation. Let Jim and I know what you want to talk about next, and we'll do that. Um, before we go, Jim, there was one particular question just, just how does uh, that came in was is, is how um, how how should we be thinking about the climate aspect of the sustainability of aspect of, of that? Um, and and where does that play into our decision process of, of, of de-risking de building stability into the supply chain? Yeah, no, that's a good, good question um, that we didn't really touch on. Uh, but it, I think it starts with... Um, you know, back when we were talking about the, and the, on a prior slide in terms of the different events, right? That's the, the volatile events that are driving these, these external forces that's driving the uh, variability in supply chains. Clearly climate and climate change is, is one of those, right? Uh, it's one of those levers, one of those drivers. Um, I can tell you right now with a number of my clients, when we talk about de-risking to your point, Douglas, it's not just about de-risking in terms of geopolitical factors, but it's, it's certainly climate change, right? And sustainability. So looking at your supplier base in terms of their carbon footprint um, or, you know, the risk involved uh, being located, having their plants or warehouses located in, in areas that are more prone to uh, natural disasters and climate change, right? So it is a very much um, a, a critical element or dimension of the stability index and stability in general, right, for supply chains. So you know, I fully agree with that. Yeah, and I think keeping that triple bottom line in mind when you are considering nearshoring, reshoring efforts, that's that's absolutely absolutely critical. So, again, thanks everybody for for joining, Jim. Thank you as always. Um, lovely to to have a chance to to chat. Um, for for those who are interested in more information on the index, you can find the index on both the KPMG website as well as the ASCM website. We're going to continue to try to bring you quarterly insights uh, and share those out with you. Um, and try to get some additional information in your hands that will assist in some decision-making processes for you and a better understanding of the key variables that drive instability in the supply chain. So from my side, thank you very much. And Jim, I'll give you a few chance to say goodbye as well. No, I think you put it well. Uh, thanks everyone. And thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, thanks to ASCM for, for partnering with us at KPMG. Uh, look forward to future conversations.